Welcome back to the Original Gangsters podcast. I'm uh, here in my uh, command center, home office. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato, here with my partner in crime and co-conspirator, Scott Bernstein. Hey, now. And before we get started, just want to remind everyone, please subscribe to our video channel on YouTube and our podcast on, on Spotify, Google, Apple, wherever you find podcasts. And uh, also shout out to Benny, our producer and engineer. So we're pretty excited about our episode today. Uh, we have an award-winning journalist, uh, Brian Collister from Texas, is 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 with us, and uh, he is also the um, found. I think you're are you the founder or the CEO of the Investigative uh, Network? Are you the founder too? Uh, founder and CEO of the Investigative Network. Okay, great. Thank you. So we have um, a, a great investigative journalist with us who is, has done a lot of reporting on the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. So we're going to spend this episode uh, deep diving the Bandidos Motorcycle Club. And I'm really looking forward to this because Scott and I are in the Midwest. And um, just speaking for myself, I don't know a lot about the Bandidos. And uh, I know, Scott, I I think I don't think you've covered them much in your yeah, reporting I, either. My, my, you know, I'm interested. I don't want to get too far ahead of ourselves, but um, if we want to start in the 2020s and then maybe go backwards and use this as a segue you know my first dive into bandito's reporting was in the last six months um related to my chronicling of this so-called blue wave uh the pagans expansion and uh how it's affected other clubs, including kind of uh, our home club in, in Detroit, the, the Outlaws and uh, the Hells Angels and whatnot. And I was getting good intel from Outlaws uh, in late 22, early 23 about this arrangement that they had cre- uh, crafted with the Bandidos, uh, which allowed outlaws to go into certain parts of this country that they hadn't been welcomed before. They could wear their collars down in Texas is what I heard. Um, and then, and that alliance or, or relationship that's been formed is a reaction to the pagans who have, who had, who have had about a 15 year relationship with the Mongols, but it's, I think it's been more ramped up. Uh, with with the with this blue wave expansion effort and this was kind of a counter to that have you heard that brian that the outlaws and banditos have, have come to some type of understanding recently no i hadn't heard that my uh most of my reporting with the banditos goes uh um, basically up to the the shootout in waco and and okay. the trial that happened in san antonio um <laughs> that my best my best contact, my best source of information with the banditos is sitting in federal prison for the rest of his life. Ah, does that? But what what I'm what I've reported does that sound possible or plausible to absolutely. you, or is that like you're yeah okay yeah absolutely. I mean, it's all about turf, um, and if they're not going to patch patch over, I don't know if you've heard that term before, but if yeah. they're not going to patch over, um, then coming up with some type of agreement where they can wear their colors on their on their territory. Um, that sounds like it sounds like something that's being pushed by uh, the reality that if they're not if they if they if they don't allow that they're going to stay too small of a club and they're going to get run over or run out of their territory. So it, it sounds like a logical move to me. Yeah, you know, I got from two separate sources that are Midwesterners tied to the outlaws, but because of their job in the building construction field they do work in texas and they were telling me that up until let's say this year when they went down to texas they could never show their colors and that at some point early this year late last year uh they are now when they've they've gone into i think the houston area to for for work uh not not i just want to be clear not motorcycle club related work like actual employment work um and they were allowed to uh you know show their colors wear their colors for the first time so uh, i guess we'll see where that goes but uh jimmy you want to throw it back to, to yeah maybe kind of like take it you know take it up to the thirty thousand foot view 
Yeah, yeah. Um, Brian, you want to like start just describing our audience how you, you know, you were a reporter in Texas, how you got started, you know, interested in this particular subject in this club and, and some of the highlights. And, and then, uh, you know, we'll go from there. Sure. So uh, I've uh, lived in Texas most of my life. And uh, even before I uh, became a reporter, was very familiar with the Banditos. They were uh, known and notorious uh, throughout Texas. And uh, so when I became a reporter, um, I, I uh, worked my way up to the San Antonio market. Um, so I worked at a television station in San Antonio. Uh, and although the organization, uh, the president and uh, sort of the, the headquarters, if you will, was known to be Houston, um, the vice president, whose name is John Portillo, um, he was leading the San Antonio chapter, which was the largest chapter that they had. So uh, in the course of my reporting, um, I one day just got a wild hair and decided I wanted to try to see if I could get the banditos to talk. Um, they didn't, as you can imagine, they didn't make a habit of talking to reporters. Um, so I reached out and through their website, strangely enough, uh, at the time, and this was early 2000s, and eventually um, wound up speaking with uh, the the then president. At that at that moment, the president was out of uh, Bellingham, Washington, George Weggers, right. and uh, I wound up talking with George. And George, uh, I told him I wanted to not only uh, do some reporting on them, but also potentially shoot a documentary and spend time with them, which we did. And uh, the documentary uh, didn't result from that, but the, the footage was used eventually in some of my reporting. Um, but George's position was that he wanted to try to change the image of the Banditos um, from Hellraisers and, and criminals and, you know, the, the biker lifestyle to uh, just a bunch of guys that like to ride bikes together. And like any other large organization, they have some bad apples, but so does law enforcement. Um, so we started the process of, of basically hanging out with the banditos. And I formed a, a strong relationship with the vice president. who uh, Again, John Portillo is his name. Uh, we'll talk about him later um, when we talk about the shootout in Waco. Um, but because I was in San Antonio and John was in San Antonio, we wound up, we would go to lunch. You know, and here we'd be sitting uh, in a Mexican restaurant in San Antonio, the vice president of the Banditos and an investigative TV reporter. Um, and we'd be talking about all sorts of things. Um, a lot, there were several incidents uh, during my reporting time, uh, which which we can cover some of those bases. Um, but oftentimes what wound up happening was there would be a, a public incident um, and John Portillo would call me and say, what should we do as, as a club? And like asking me for PR advice, basically. You were the media uh, conciliary. Yeah, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> essentially, uh, you know, he, he, you know, he called me up and say, the police chief is saying this, that, and another thing about us, what should we do? And I said, well, tell your story, you know, let me come out and do an interview with you. And in one case, I suggested he hold a press conference. And when, uh, uh, I can't remember his name off the top of my head, but there was a boxer uh, in San Antonio who was a local local boy made good. And uh, he was murdered by a bandito named Richard Merla. And uh, when that happened, uh, that just opened up the can of worms again for the banditos. Um, and the chief of police was letting them have it in the media. And uh, so they had a press conference. Um, and those are all things that sort of, because of my relationship with John um, just sort of naturally happened. And over the years, we got to know each other better and hung out, um, you know, usually with a TV camera somewhere nearby, but sometimes we would just get together and, and have lunch. And at, the, at this time, I just want to contextualize Jimmy for the sure. audience. Yeah, yeah jump in. Uh, Jeff Pike was the president. So George right. Weggers was the president. Uh, Until like 05. Oh, right. And then. Um, and then it switched to Jeff Pike. And Pike Pike was based out of where? Out of Houston, just outside of Houston, Tomball. So you have 
Pike in Houston and Portillo down in San Antonio. Right. And did you get any exposure to Pike? No, Pike was um, uh, P- Pike was sort of the uh, like the man behind the curtain. He didn't he didn't like to go out in public. He um, he stayed pretty much on a uh, on his property uh, outside of Houston. Um, I think he was uh, I think he was a mechanic uh, by trade. Um, but yeah, I, I don't. I went on several uh, rides with them. Went to um, Sturgis with them, um, and don't ever remember uh, seeing or meeting Pike. He was very very hesitant to be out in public with the with the banditos, and I mean general public, not yeah. like a, a small event that they would have. Or a I, I don't know. Event. This is a, this is just a really quick aside, but I, I don't know if you've seen the uh, television show Tulsa King. But in Tulsa King, they have a, well, not, a, it, I don't want to be, uh, spoiler alert, they had a, a character that was a biker boss whose last name was Pike. Um, and I'm guessing that uh, the creator of that show, Taylor Sheridan, who's from the, the, uh, you know, that part of the country, was probably inspired by Jeff Pike to create the, the character Carson Pike. Sounds like more uh, than a coincidence. That's yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Now go back to <laughs> Jimmy. Go ahead. Yeah. I was just going to say some uh, shameless self-promotion here. Uh, we have an episode on our channel where we interviewed George Christie, who was a, you know, a heavyweight with the hell's angels. And we spent a lot of time talking about this with George. And, and I want to see w- what you think uh, about the results with the banditos with their attempt in Texas, but George Christie, you know, he, this was a conscious decision on his part to he, he, he had this position that we know that the, the government, they're saying we're the mafia on wheels. The local media says, you know, we're, we're criminals. And he and his point was like, we can either let them define us or we can actually instead of being so secretive and, you know, not saying anything, we should try to craft our own image, really like public relations, like you're, like you're talking about, Brian. And they were they were fairly successful. Remember, George Christie had the famous Olympic, you know, he carried the torch at the 84 Olympics and, uh, you know, the toys for tots and they were active in the community. And it, and it, it, it worked for a while of like changing the, the paradigm of that the Hells Angels aren't, aren't scary guys. They might be tough guys and they like motorcycles and you probably don't want to mess with them, but they're not an organized, uh, you know, criminal group. And. Uh, I, I watched your reporting on, on KXAN, that the video footage is on YouTube, and it, it's really great where it seems like the banditos are trying to do something similar there. Um, did it work? I mean, what, what, how well did that go down, in that, that, that PR? Well, I, it, it, it clearly was a PR motivation. It certainly was uh, with George Weggers and then uh, on a local level uh, and even a regional Texas level, uh, John Portillo obviously getting permission from Jeff Pike at that point, but would allow us to, uh, I think, uh, uh, basically hang out with them and, and report with them from time to time. Um, it, it, um, I don't know if it worked or not. It didn't, it didn't sway the chief of police, Bill McManus in San Antonio. Um, anytime there was an incident or an arrest with the banditos, he would make the point that, you know, as you said, they're the mafia on wheels. They're, uh, organized crime, drug dealers, gun runners, uh, you know, they run prostitution, uh, all, of, all of the things that these uh, groups, these clubs are accused of doing. He would he would basically go in and make that point. Yeah. Um, so if, if people watch the video um, on, on YouTube, it's really remarkable because at one point they even were receiving an award from a city councilwoman. <laughs> so he wanted to, I mean, I, I encourage them to watch it for themselves, but you want to give us a share. That right. Of it. So what happened, the reason that video is on, uh, on YouTube is because after the, uh, the shootout in Waco, um, I was the only person to speak to a bandito representative uh, right after the shootout in Waco. And they, they did an interview. Uh, we had over a million hits on on the story on uh, the TV station's website at the time, um, and but they were putting out a message. There had been a rumor that they had put out uh, that they were going to strike back at law enforcement 
after the the biker shootout uh, in Waco, and they wanted to dispel that. So that's why they did. And then uh, once again, I on the phone talking to John Portillo in San Antonio, although now I was in Austin, and I said, John, you really need to have somebody come out and and do an interview. So they connected me with uh, one of the members in in Austin. But what you were, were referring to is um, when I worked in San Antonio um, on a Saturday, John allowed us to come out uh, with camera um, to one of their hangout events, you know, music, barbecue, beer, the whole nine yards. And as soon as I walked in, a very familiar face looked at me and said, oh, hey, how are you doing, Brian? And uh, uh, glad to see you. The, by the way, the councilwoman is going to be here in just a little bit. I said, OK, uh, the person was a representative of uh, of a local organization and uh, not affiliated with the banditos, but apparently friendly. Um, and, and I walked away and I was thinking, councilwoman, what is he, what is he talking about? The councilwoman gave the banditos a proclamation on behalf of the city of San Antonio, signed auto pen, I'm sure, but signed by the mayor and the entire city council for their good deeds for their good work in the community. And we recorded it. We did a quick interview with her. And as soon as we aired that story, all hell broke loose. She apparently somehow sort of snuck it through City Hall, did not have permission. Um, it became a huge uh, problem for her. And she was up for re-election and she lost her, her re-election bid shortly thereafter. So uh, while she thought they were doing some good in the community, the fact that she went and got a proclamation signed by the mayor and council members of San Antonio uh, didn't sit well with the public officials once once we blasted it out on the airwaves and they found out what was going on. Can, uh, can I throw uh, yeah, jump in. Yep. some uh, historical, uh, not necessarily context, but I guess context and then ask uh, Brian to respond or. So taking on this idea that uh, George Uyghurs, when he takes over, I think in the late 90s, that he decides to try to do a rebrand of some sort, uh, a PR campaign to make people you know, get a more, in their opinion, realistic viewpoint of who these guys are. They're not the mafia on wheels and so forth. Uh, How, you know, from my very brief research on this club you had two guys that were kind of like the Babe Ruth and Luke Gehrig or the LeBron James and Dwayne Wade if you will bring it into more modern times uh of of the banditos uh Don Chambers who they called mother who was the founder and then uh Ron Hodge who was like the second founder or second president they called stepmother um, how, how does Uyghur's leadership differ from the original two? Well, it was quite a departure for the club. First, he was the first uh, and only outside of Texas. Um, you know, he was way up there in Bellingham, Washington, yeah. and the, the club is the majority based in Texas. It was that was very unusual. Um, I can tell you that his. Uh, my conversations with him uh, about us uh, being allowed to record and interview them, um, he was very, he was very uh, straightforward about what he had hoped that would do, which, as you described, that it would portray the image that they wanted to portray. But I can tell you, after we started to hang out with them, uh, including a, a trip, uh, we went on, on a ride and followed them to Galveston, which is very close to to Houston. And uh, I can remember while we were there, um, I was doing an interview with uh, uh, one of the Bandito's old ladies, as they would describe them. And um, I, it was a relatively innocuous question, you know, or a conversation. But one of the Bandito's came up and stepped in front of the camera and looked at me and said, that's enough. Mm -hmm. And my conversations with a couple of other club members, it became clear that not everybody was on board with what George was doing um, and they didn't like it one bit. So, but, but we were safe. We were being protected by the top guy and, and the number two. So it, it, we just had to take the cue and cut the interview short. From, That's a great point. Yeah. From what you know about 
you know, these historic leaders and mother and stepmother. Is this a total departure from these two leading the group from the I know, uh, Chambers founded the group in the, I think, 66. Uh, Hodge, by the 80s, Hodge was leading it and, and took them uh, outside of the country, made them international. But were they just like, we don't care that there's an image out there that we're hellraisers and we're we are the hell's angels, I guess, of Texas. That or, they absolutely loved it. There. Okay, image. so that I just want to make sure yeah, that the, absolutely yeah, de- yeah. De- delineate between the eras. Yeah, and that's why I think a lot of them had a hard time uh, with, with our presence there with what Weggers was doing. Uh, and there were some. Uh, I understand there were some other leadership related issues. Some of the banditos didn't like the fact that the president wasn't in Texas, um, although he certainly was present a lot. Um, uh, and Weggers eventually went and and did prison time as well. Uh, years later, did he have uh, a vice? Did he have a vice president in Texas? The vice president was John Portillo. Under Weggers too. Okay. Yep. Yeah, I'm not sure when John became vice president, but he was vice president uh, with Weggers and with Pike. And what was the situation of, uh, about how, how does Weggers get power? Do we know the backstory on that? I, I don't know, other than it's a popularity contest, right? I mean, it's uh, how he uh, how he went about campaigning or convincing the other banditos that he should be the club president. I don't know, uh, or if it was handed down to him by the whoever was present before that. Um, I'm not really sure how that process took place, or for that matter, how Pike became president. Um, but I, I think. Um, I well, think I, think in, Pike, I think Pike became president because Weggers went to jail. Is that? Yeah, prob- probably. Yeah. Uh, and in terms of Weggers, um, another thing I just want to throw in your direction and get your comment on, you know, for me, outside of just these last, let's say, year where I've been reporting on outlaws, possibly joining forces with banditos, uh, really my first glimpse of banditos nation uh was when i was doing a little reporting on the the great quebec biker war of the uh not late 90s and 2000s which coincided with weggers taking power and i know weggers was well at one point traveled to canada um and jimmy do you want to call that up for the audience to let them kind of know how that was all playing out well, just just uh, if people aren't familiar with that, Hell's Angels, you know, Quebec, Montreal, that's usually Hell's Angels territory. And there was another club there, the Rock Machine. And I'm not an expert on it, but my understanding is that they they uh, were going to patch over with the Banditos. And this didn't go over well. And there was there was a right. war. Well, the Hell's Angels and the Rock Machine got into a war. Right. Uh, they had the Rock Machine had spawned off from the Hell's Angels. And then they were going to war with each other. Hell's Angels were, were getting reinforcements from the United States. Rock Machine was a, 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 a Quebec-based biker club. And they somehow connected with the Banditos down in Texas and got the, 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 the support, uh, resources, people, weapons. From you know Weger's administration, Weger's administration. Did did you, did you know a lot about that? Did you get a chance to talk to him about that? Uh, I didn't get a chance to talk to George about that at the time. Um, we didn't touch on. I, I'm trying to remember if that was during the time period where I was communicating with him uh, or not. But uh, I think it was. I think it was around two thousand ish. Yeah, I think it was. I think it was uh, slightly before the and opportunity I be- that I had to interview them. I believe Weggers got kicked out of Canada. Like they, like RCMP came to a meeting that he was having and like said, "We want you out of the country. We're driving to the airport." I seem to recall that story. Yeah, yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean to uh, again go down another rabbit hole there, but yeah, yeah, I mean, when, that was my that was my first. Yeah, uh, even even Australia, there was a huge uh, war that went on in Australia that involved the banditos. And I seem to recall something about uh, somebody used like a rocket launcher 
um, in that. I don't know if you're familiar with with what went down in Australia, but that was uh, I mean, there was it, it wouldn't be their first fight. But uh, what they did in Canada, um, I think, caught the attention of U.S. law enforcement. I think I think that was part. Obviously, it caught the attention of Canadian law enforcement. But um, I, I think it uh, I think they did themselves a big disservice and they put a, a large target on their on their heads when they did that. Which, Jimmy, do you, it's interesting to to see the um, maybe the disconnect from Weggers coming into power in 98 and saying we want to re emphasize that we're not the mafia on wheels or around that time. But then, then on the other side of it, he's negotiating with guys in Canada, you know, bikers in Canada, uh, and I believe he, I believe he met with um, Vito Rizzuto too, like as, in, at some type of sit down at, at peace conference. So well, I'll tell you from it, my it kind of flies it flies in the face of of the notion that I, we we don't want to be viewed as gangsters, right? But from from my reporting, my perspective. Um, I was never fooled into believing that they were a bunch of guys who just like like to ride bikes. No, I'm not um, saying you, Brian. Don't think I'm, I'm not. Saying no, no, you no. Were. no. I was always very conscious of that. You yeah. know, I, I didn't want people to get that perception that I could be snowed like that. I just didn't have, uh, you know, to to me the access and and getting to interview them and talk to them was was a bit, huge step. Were they going to admit to me that they've done all these horrible illegal things? No, they weren't. Uh, but that wasn't the the point so much. Uh, but it was to to be able to sort of open up their world a little bit and see inside it. I was just trying to color up who George Weggers is, that he could say one thing, but then at the same time be traveling across international borders to meet and, with mafia dons and, and other biker bosses. And frankly, the same with Portillo. You know, uh, John Portillo. Um, uh, uh, as you well know, probably that uh, he went to prison with Jeff Pike uh, as a result of the uh, investigation that took place after the biker shootout in Waco. And they went for what was essentially a RICO charge. Um, but, you know, I, I wasn't I wasn't oblivious enough to realize that Portillo had done things uh, that he didn't exactly want to talk to me about. There's this, there was an incident where. In San Antonio, a, a very close lieutenant of, of Portillo's was shot and killed outside of a pool hall um, by some local gangbanger, not even a motorcycle club. Well, years, years later, uh, I, was, uh, I was told uh, by a source that what had, uh, what had happened was there was some type of dispute, some type of fight. And the gangbanger waited outside for uh, the bandito to leave and then shot him in the parking lot. Well, a few weeks later, that gang member wound up being found shot multiple times in the head at a, 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 a truck stop uh, just outside of San Antonio. I was told one of the people that pulled the trigger uh, was John Portillo. And that was because this guy had committed the ultimate, you know, offense of, of killing someone that he felt like was one of his brothers. Um, true or not, I'm not, you know, I'm going to say allegedly pulled the trigger. Um, what they, and the way it was described to me, it took them a while to figure out who this gang member was, but of course they were able to. They talked to uh, a young female who I'm not sure if she knew the gang member uh, or or just approach the gang member, but she lured him to this truck stop um, on the on the premise of a date, if you will. And um, while they were in the car, the Richard Merla, uh, the other bandito I, I told you about, um, and uh, John Portillo and and I believe one other at least pulled the pulled the gang member out of the car and and killed him. Well, I want to. Um eventually get to the sort of the, the history of the banditos in Texas and then fast forward, connect that to Waco. But I just want to make something, a comment on that, see what you guys think. I, I'm a criminologist as my day job. And I, so I'm interested in this conceptually. And one of the issues I have with like 
the way law enforcement frames things. And I, I'm not, please don't misunderstand. I'm not justifying murder. Uh, I don't want people to misunderstand. But if a gang banger starts something with a biker at a bar and they get into some kind of scuffle, someone gets shot, then there's another shooting in retaliation. That doesn't mean it's organized crime related. And, and you know, someone may be thinking, oh, well, what's the difference? Well, I, conceptually, there is a still a big difference. It's not to justify murder or, or, you know, a club fighting it out with a gang. But those types of case studies where, where the, someone's shot, law enforcement will use that as evidence that this is this is this is mafia. And to me, mafia is is always about organized crime. And so I don't know about this particular case study, but if there's an incident at a bar, someone gets shot. I'm not trying to justify that. I'm just saying conceptually, it may not be organized crime. What, what What's do you the difference that, between personal and business? Crime? Yeah, right. Exactly. It's the difference between personal and business. Um, this this gangbanger was stupid enough to uh, to kill a bandito and not realize what that meant, which was that that you were going to get hunted down like a dog and killed by his brothers. I mean, Jimmy, I would say that an organized crime murder would be defined by it enhances the killer's position in the organization that they're a part of. Or, yeah, for 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 some kind of entrepreneurial, like yeah. some kind of like economic uh, gain. So I, I, yeah, I'm just interested in those kind of because um, I, I, I always have the sense that when the FBI puts out its, um, uh, you know, the, the, the gang assessment that some of that's inflated when they, when they talk about gang related crimes, sometimes it's just a case of a street gang bumps into another street gang member at a party and they have words and someone gets shot. And I'm not saying, trying to say that that's okay, but, but, but to, to rack that up as, Oh, see, this is, this is all these gangs are involved in organized crime. I, I think conceptual Clarity is 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 important. At least I do. So anyhow, um, but if, if we can, um, so talk about the banditos how they how they start in Texas because I, I think then that that relates to ends up with the, the Cossacks and other clubs. But in the late nineteen sixties, am, am I correct in saying that you don't have the Hell's Angels or any of the the major clubs there? So is that how the banditos sort of start? It's kind of a, an alternative in a place where you don't have the major clubs. Right. I almost think that the um, uh, the that the the founder, Don Chambers, uh, saw the the Hell's Angels as sort of like a template, you know, as uh, uh, and then began the club here uh, in the Houston area. Um, And then it just took off from there. Um, You know, I don't know if you you're familiar with their their logo, uh, the, the their patch. Um, but that comes from, uh, uh, the caricature with the sombrero on comes from the Frito Bandito, um, character from, you know, Frito Lay, if you will, the uh, corporate logo. Uh, but that's, they, they sort of picked up that Frito Bandito and, and call themselves the Banditos. And, and so they eventually become the hegemonic club in texas and so that that's going to, to lead us to this situation where there's would you say the cossacks are like that maybe the second largest motorcycle club in texas is that accurate brian yeah no, but but yet not large i mean you know what i mean like it was um by, by saying next uh, in terms of size they were nowhere near the size of the banditos just just to give a timeline chambers finds the group in 66 or finds the club in 66 uh as Mother Chambers and then stepmother Hodge takes over, I think it's as early as 72. And Chambers, I believe, was an ex-Marine who yeah. got out and just couldn't find his niche in life until he sort of created this. And then he goes to prison too, I think not long after founding it, I I believe. Yeah, Chambers, yes. Yeah. Um, so that's the landscape. The banditos are the major club in town. And uh, we're going to fast forward here to the to the Waco incident because we've already referenced that a number of times. This is a huge story. Uh, this is uh, 2015, right? And um, tell us about the the organization that's going to have that meeting at the restaurant. Why they were doing that? 
and then walk us through the, <laughs> the melee, if you can, Brian, based on your reporting. So uh, um, among the what they call the support groups, the, uh, the other uh, sort of independent bikers, if you will, um, I can't remember the exact name of the organization, but they would get together and they would have meetings. They would have, have get togethers. And that's what that's what was going on in uh, Waco at the Twin Peaks restaurant. This group was having a get together and it involved all sorts of different clubs that that the band. So the band leaders wouldn't necessarily patch over every club. You could be you could as long as you had their permission. You could be a, a subcategory of the banditos, if you will. So that's what was going on uh, in Waco. Now, they had had issues with the Cossacks uh, prior to that, obviously, as, as we all know. And it, it was alleged in the trial that John Portillo, the then vice president, was the one who, who said, we're going to go to war with them. And uh, I talked to John shortly after the, the shootout uh, happened, and he literally was about 60 seconds from pulling in the parking lot, um, riding up from San Antonio when he got a call, don't come here, I turn back around, just finish shooting. So uh, he left and was not, was not there that day. Um, but th that's... That's my experience, you know, in terms of what I know about the, the shootout that hasn't been widely reported anyway. Well, the, so Waco just in Texas, that's what in between Dallas and Austin, roughly. Yes, it's okay. a, it's it's a it's a good central meeting point. So the Cossacks, which I believe were primarily up in the Dallas area, decided they were going to attend and make some trouble and um, and. That got to law enforcement, and law enforcement was there and and prepared. Um, and then we had the bloody shootout. Yeah. So the the organization, well, I don't know if it still exists, the Texas Confederation of Clubs and Independents. They're they're going to have their meeting. So both clubs show up now. From what I've read, each club accuses the other one of starting it. But uh, but if people are unfamiliar with this incident. Um, Event, I think there's some pushing and shoving, and then is it, eventually is it, it's, in it's in 2015. Let's let yeah. people know. Yeah, yeah. So eventually, there's some shooting, and um, I think uh, let's see here, um, nine people were were killed during. Yep. The, so this was this 20, was 20 wounded, kill. 20 wounded, right? And um, almost 200 people arrested um, as a result. So, do you have any insight, Brian, into? Is it still this like he he said she said in terms of who who instigated it? it it's very much a who said what to who first, but it's also um, it's very clouded. We've we've never gotten clarity on who pulled the trigger first. Uh, there is a, a theory that it was law enforcement that that had snipers set up and that they started doing the shooting. Um, I know that the lawsuit. Uh, the several lawsuits are still ongoing and the, the district attorney who was who took a lot of heat for the way he approached the case. Um, the last I heard, you he still hadn't been deposed. Um, and so I, I think there's still a lot more reporting to be done on that case. Um, but I don't think we know at this point who started the shooting and, and who finished the shooting. Um, but from from all of the video that I've seen, I didn't see any uh, bikers with with guns in their hands, um, but we certainly know that that uh, nine people died in that shootout, and that's where the speculation that it was law enforcement that did most of the shooting, if not well, all. Yeah, I want to make a point and see see what you think. So, uh, my understanding is that police made this big deal about their rapid response time, but there were bikers at the meeting that were saying the cops were already there. That, that, that that's a false narrative. Yeah, no, it wasn't a response. It. They were waiting. They, they were, were absolutely waiting. They were wait. So I think that's a pretty intriguing idea that that law enforcement um, may have have instigated this. And we know of other cases where um, basically you're talking about entrapment, where they you know they instigate things within clubs or between between clubs. But I want to make this point um, that. My understanding is that some of the victims took headshots and uh, 
torso wounds. And when you think about the forensics of a shooting, if if, if all these guys have handguns and it's it's like the OK Corral, um, it seems difficult to imagine that people would take hits like that with such precision. Which then, if you if you connect those dots, then the, the argument is like, well, that's because that's not what happened. In fact, there were trained SWAT team or or some kind of law enforcement personnel who were picking people off. And are you familiar with that? That argument, Brian, and what do you make of that? Right. There absolutely uh, were sharpshooters there. Um, I have uh, uh, the photos have never been publicly released, but I've seen the photographs of some of the bandidos that were shot and on the ground and, and the photographs that were taken uh, after the scene. And they clearly had, had headshots. Um, and so you're right. That doesn't that doesn't sort of add up to, you know, fist fight breaks out. Somebody pulls a gun uh, again. I would maybe I missed it, but I would I would. Yeah, my perception is I didn't see in any of that video from the internal and external cameras that were the surveillance uh, at that restaurant. I didn't see anybody, any of the bikers displaying a, a, a weapon um, or the start start the shooting. Yeah. And, and there's some also just some controversy with, with the way things were, were handled. Um, even like um, like some of the individuals there who did not have firearms on them. And, and by the way, some of the guys who, who did, you know, if they, if, they, if they weren't convicted felons, I mean, Texas is a pretty gun friendly state. So just because you have a handgun doesn't mean you're 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 up to no good. Um, but a lot of those guys were not armed, and yet they were zip tied and um, held for a long time with with like really extraordinary bail. Like what was it, like a million dollars or something like that. Some of these guys did not; they they didn't even have criminal records. They didn't have any firearms on them, and yet they're they're uh, <laughs> they're. Yeah. Um, there were you know, weekend bikers there. There were there were weekend weekenders that were there, and basically law enforcement took the position and this became part of the controversy they literally arrested every biker they could find yeah i mean it, it seems like a, a if, if you deep dive the case it seems to me like there were some major civil liberties some violations of civil liberties here with with the extraordinary high bail and and also the way things were handled um what's the sense in texas in the community about this i know it's a few years gone by now but what what's your take on like just people in the community, what what do they think happened? Uh, I think it was a wake up call for a lot of people. They they you know when you're driving down the highway and you see somebody blow by you and they've got a Bandito's rocker, you know on on the back of their uh, you know their vest, um, it, it um, it's like oh cool check that out. Um, there hadn't been a violent uh, clash like that in forever. I mean, it was the, the, the biggest thing that, that's ever happened. I mean, you would hear about isolated small incidences here and there. Um, so I think it was a wake up call for, for the public in general. And then things started to unravel. And it wasn't, oh, this is this. Obviously, there were uh, big, bad biker groups that were you know going at each other. But then all of the all of the other people that got ensnared. Uh, in this from the weekend bikers to, you know, people that were not even club affiliated. Um, I think that's when public perception so, sort of shifted a little bit. Uh, and then, as you said, it started people started looking at the civil liberties uh, related issues that took place. Yeah, because there wasn't there something where they, they the person they put in, I mean, Scott's a, a, a lawyer in addition, or not, he's, he has a law degree, but in addition to being a reporter, but um the, the, the person they put in charge of the grand jury was it wasn't there a conflict of interest there wasn't it like a, a cop who was there it was, former, it was a former police officer i believe yeah so i mean what do you make of that either brian or scott i mean doesn't that seem to be like a conflict of interest i mean, the, the lot, I mean if what if there's anything that i've learned in my 15 plus years of reporting on this stuff is just that the, the lines between the law and the criminals that these the lawmen are tasked with with uh, dismantling it, it just especially at this level not not at like the street level but at the level of uh, organization that this is at it's just the, the lines are so murky 
And, and there's so much gray area there that is, you know, morally and ethically compromised and not necessarily by the book. And it's the mindset that the ends justify the means. Yeah, I mean, to, to Brian's point that there hadn't been a um, major incident of like um, violence within within the club. Um, at least not to this extent for a while, that, that fits into that conspiracy narrative that law enforcement instigated this because they wanted something to fit their narrative that this is the mafia on wheels, they're very dangerous. Then you have this, this massive incident that makes global news, and um, therefore this justifies more prosecutions, more money for law enforcement. Um, and I, and I think that that can be like a structural analysis. I, I don't necessarily think that's a conspiracy theory. Uh, maybe maybe it is. But one thing I ask my students, Brian, is when when we look at the the FBI's gang um, threat assessment, their conclusions are there's there's more street gangs than ever. There's more outlaw motorcycle clubs than ever. They're all dangerous. They're all involved in drugs. They're all involved in murder. And I asked my students, what would you expect? What would you expect their conclusions to be? And, and you know, we can get into the data and look at it. And, and but like, uh, of course, they're going to say that. Right. You think the FBI is going to put out a report that says nothing to see here. <laughs> there's no crime. There's no there's no threats. We don't, don't give us any more money. Don't give us any more resources. Don't hire any more agents. So um, I'm sorry if that comes off as, as cynical, but I think that's a, a structural analysis to think about. So, so Brian, I don't know if you have any, any thoughts on that. Well, I, I think you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people in law enforcement that um, earn a good living, or a living anyway, um, doing exactly what you just explained. Um, ironically, uh, I remember... Uh, one of the first public comments that the banditos made was John Portillo in San Antonio. And um, it was after uh, uh, after some bandito had been busted for, I think, a small amount of marijuana and some uh, some weapons. And um, he came out and publicly trashed the police department because just a few months earlier, eight San Antonio police officers had been arrested for. Uh, running protection for drug dealers and were arrested by the FBI. And he's like, we've got fewer people arrested in our club than they do in their police force. Uh, and he made a good point. <laughs> you know, it, that, that one really stuck. Um, so I, I think your 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 theory is, is right on. I mean, even here in Michigan, Detroit, Scott, I don't know if you saw recently, like people in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office, several Several investigators in the Wayne County Prosecutor's Office were were arrested yeah. uh, on on like uh, I, was it racketeering or bribery? I can't, I can't remember. Yeah, that. I mean, law enforcement in Detroit has long been an entrepreneurial endeavor. <laughs> it's more than just being a public servant. Yeah, it, it has a, a bad reputation. Um, and so, let me ask you, Brian, because I'm interested in this this like kind of philosophical argument that and, and you see this in 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 the reporting with the um, kxan story which is this idea where the, the member of the bandito says look um there may be some individual members who are involved in criminal activities we, we don't deny that um but that's on them like that's their individual if they're if they're hustling out there on their own that that is not something that the club sanctions it's not something the club uh, mandates. Uh, the club doesn't receive any proceeds from that. And if that person does that, that's their business. So um, it's not to justify, but this idea that we're a mafia on wheels just conceptually is is not is not true. Um, what do you make of that that argument? Because I, I hear that a lot when I do field research, when I interview people who are members of uh, well, you know, one percenters. They'll make that that similar argument, and and I noticed that in your reporting, some of the people you interviewed said that. What do you make of that argument? I think it's bullshit. Okay, <laughs> okay, <laughs> nice and succinct. Uh, I, I I think that it's um, I, I think there are members that go uh, off the reservation, if you will, and get caught. Um, but I think ultimately the 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 structure of some of the clubs uh, clearly is uh, from an an organized or maybe even disorganized 
uh, a criminal organization. Um, but it, you know, these these clubs can't function financially unless they're bringing in money and and they do that through criminal activity. What do you make of uh, that? A lot of the guys have um, legit jobs. Um, they do. Yeah, they okay. do. Um, I, I think uh, I think the I think there's a difference in levels. OK. And this is just me talking just from my own theories. Um, I think the higher up you are, the more trusted you then become. And then you are you take part in some of the organized criminal activity. Um, I think below that level is is uh, that type of uh, club member that you're talking about um, who maybe has a, a day job. John Portillo had an air conditioning business and used to swear all the time that, you know, he was doing the best he could to make a, make a living, uh, you know, fixing and selling air conditioning units. Um, so I, I think, you know, are they going to trust someone at a lower level uh, to be involved in the higher level criminal activity? No way. I mean, they're, they're still trying to figure out if they're a snitch. Um, so I, I think it has to do with uh, uh, with the higher you are, the bigger your responsibilities and involvement would be in the criminal activity. That's just my perception. So um, another thing I, I wanted to ask you, Brian, about the, the culture uh, from people you talk to, I, I know you're reporting, um, you've gone in a different direction after 2015, but since then there's been this like, you know, sons of anarchy blowing up. <laughs> and, and so in some ways that's, that's changed the perception in, in, I think probably good ways and bad ways for these clubs in, in a good way, it, it sort of has this godfather, like romanticization, where now some people think, oh, bikers are, these are really cool guys. Like, I, I'd like to be around these guys. On the other hand, the Sons of Anarchy really plays into this idea that they're just organized criminal, <laughs> organized criminal groups. So there's, it kind of can cut, can cut both ways. Um, I've heard different things from people I've talked to. Uh, some guys I've talked to say they, 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 they didn't like the show at all. They thought it was bullshit. And um, other guys found it entertaining. So do, do you have any, uh, what's your sense of like, just like pop culture um, with, with the banditos? What, what's their interaction with that or their sense of it? Uh, I think that goes along with the uh, romanticism uh, or at least the, 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 the feeling that uh, there are a lot of people that want to live their lives that way, right? There are a lot of people that see, uh, that uh, we're not going to take shit from anybody and we're going to do what we want, when we want and how we want. And I think, you know, just like with the mafia, um, that certain biker gangs attract that uh, that sentiment from people. Yeah, I think there's something in, I make the argument in some of the academic work I've published that the outlaw gene is really in the American DNA. I mean, going back to the American Revolution, but really, I, I make that argument, but then also you think of the, the folk heroes of like Billy the Kid, Jesse James, John Dillinger. I have the Al Capone <laughs> poster in my back there that there's something about like America and the Hells Angels are iconic. Like, is there something about like Americans that we like people who defy <laughs> who defy the, the powers that be? I really right. I, I think that's true. Yeah. As long as they don't come after us. Well, yeah. yeah. Right. As long as we're not in the line of fire. Yeah, sure. Right. No, that that's a good point. So. Um, what's your sense of what the landscape is now? I know you said you're, you're reporting on different things now, but there was a big case that happened in New Mexico. I don't know if you followed that, but there was um, uh, uh, an allegation there, or a, um, part of the investigation was, I think the Mongols were trying to establish clubs in New Mexico, and the banditos consider that their territory, and so there were some skirmishes. Um, any sense of like what the landscape is now in, in Texas and, and that part of the country? Well, Texas, uh, you know, the banditos will always claim Texas as their territory. I mean, it's just the, the way it is. Um, I know from my conversations uh, with John Portillo and a couple of other uh, of his lieutenants that they uh, they had constant communication with the Hells Angels hierarchy. Um, and you don't hear about them getting into skirmishes with each other. Um, and that's because it's reminiscent of the mafia and the five families 
where they they sit down and they know they know that if they start shooting at each other, that it's going to draw law enforcement. So you don't hear about Bandito and uh, and Hell's Angels, you know, causing a ruckus with each other. That's because there's almost sort of a mutual respect. They've plotted out their territories and that's it. They're not going to step over that line. Um, I remember uh, being on one of our video shoots with Portillo and a, uh, another bandito. His name was Bandito FU. And you can <laughs> got to take that. You can figure that one out for yourself. Yeah. Um, but Bandito FU was telling me we were at a, a barbecue joint that also had music. And he said that uh, he was telling me the story about how he was he was there with John. They were drinking and eating and and uh, some band came in, some band from the West Coast. And um, one of the roadies had a shirt on with the Indian head, the not a, not a full Hell's Angels, you know, intended uh, shirt, but it just had that Indian head on it. And uh, the bandito member walked up to him and said, you can either have me r- rip that shirt off of you or you can take it off and you can put this on. And he had a bandito's shirt with him. And he said the guy took it off, gave him the shirt and put the bandito's shirt on. That's how serious they are about their territory. Um, any sign, any signal that the that there be, you know, somebody stepping over that line. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the case of uh believe his name. I was looking it up while we were talking. Anthony Benish uh, in um, 2006, uh, in the early 2000s, um, he started to go around Austin, Texas, um, telling people he was a Hell's Angel and he was going to start a Hell's Angels club in Bandito territory. Um, And then one day he was coming out of a restaurant with his wife and his son and he was uh, shot by a sniper and killed. Um, and that turned out to be obviously the handiwork of the banditos, which we didn't find that out until after the uh, the shootout in Waco, when um, a lot of the the history and a lot of unsolved uh, crimes that they committed, uh, they were four bandito members who admitted to being involved in his killing. And that was simply because he had the stupidity, if you will, to uh, try and fly the Hells Angels colors uh, on bandito territory. Yeah, well, there's, I. You know, there's a lot of diplomacy and politics that goes on, whether whether you subscribe to the idea that it's organized crime or not. Either way, it's undeniable that there's a lot of politics that goes on to make sure that the clubs can coexist peacefully, which which a lot of times they do. And like I said, I've I've talked to some guys who, who you were talking about the, the runs they go on and they say I, I run into dudes from other clubs all the time and have no no problem with them. But but as you point out, sometimes sometimes there are problems. And so that's why you, you have to have like the, the, the diplomacy and the and the politics. And I and I saw an interview with, with um Weggers one time where he, he you know he said he was friends with some hell's angels and he's like if, if people don't like it i don't i don't give a shit like so um uh it's it's, it's kind of interesting uh that the politics that goes on i think at those levels you're absolutely right if they i mean like the mafia when they realize that when we get into wars it draws law enforcement they figured out the same thing in fact they probably used the mafia as a template and said look like those guys we should we should sit down and talk this out. And then so the, the skirmishes that you see are with the smaller clubs. And, you know, I don't they don't have to be t- teeny tiny, um, but they're, you know, they're not the predominant clubs usually. Yeah, I talked to um, off the record. So I, I don't want to say the person's name uh, uh, from a from a major club. And something that he mentioned to me was uh, this. This is part of like the Sons of Anarchy thing again, where. They're like these posers who want to start. They 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 want to start all outlaw biker clubs. So they're like smaller, you know, uh, clubs and and uh, and then then they run into like the the big boys. <laughs> yeah, they learn and, pretty and usually quick. They regret it. <laughs> they learn pretty quick because the big boys will stomp stomp that out, and sometimes literally. Yeah, yeah. Well, so Brian, like, um, share with our audience. I mean, what do you what do you have working on now, and how can people find out more about? your reporting and whether it was about the banditos or what you're doing now, let, let, let our audience know if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Well, uh, the investigative network is designed to take investigative reporting, investigative documentary filmmaking, and uh, we're trying to make a go of that. So right now we're working on a couple of documentaries 
uh, involving some true crime cases. And uh, hopefully you'll be seeing those at some point down the road on a Netflix and Amazon or Hulu. Um, but, you know, there's so many uh, investigative reporters uh, who can't find places to do their work anymore. We're trying to become a home for that. Yeah, I think um, that's um, something that we're in need of with the major newspapers and television stations. They're cutting their their budgets all the time, especially for field reporters. Right. It's, right. it's, it's more cost effective for them to just get something from the AP or something. Right. Absolutely. Um, and investigative reporting, they see that as just being too expensive and too high risk. Yeah, it takes too long. Right. right. Everything's like they want, like because of, you know, social media things. And so it takes too long. It's too expensive. So um, I definitely uh, wish you well. And I know from your resume, you, you looked into uh, public corruption, things like that. Is that something that still interests you that you're absolutely getting? Absolutely. I spent a lot of time when I was working at local television stations, uh, basically chasing corrupt public officials. So um, when we when we catch wind of something like that and can turn it into some content. I did, a, if you go to investigativenetwork.org, uh, you'll see the last thing that we did uh, most recently was a podcast called How to Bribe a Judge. <laughs> and we actually interviewed a judge who uh, went to prison for accepting a bribe. And then we got a hold of some FBI documents that show that there were a lot of other judges that were ensnared in the FBI's investigation, but were never uh, prosecuted. And that was because word of the investigation was leaked by a federal judge to the other judges. And um, so that's uh, that's some good good old fashioned South Texas uh, corruption. And uh, you can find that on investigativenetwork.org or any of your podcast platforms. Just it's called How to Bribe a Judge. Yeah, I think our audience would be interested in that. And I, and I would just say, if I can editorialize for a moment here before we wrap up. Um, I think that's more dangerous when you have public officials who are uh, acting in a criminal way because they have the sanction of the state. And at least with the public enemies, like old fashioned whether it's Al Capone or the Hells Angels, Banditos now, at least you know where they where they stand, right? Which side of the, the law they're on. To me, corrupt judges, cops, politicians, that's way more dangerous because they have the weight of the state behind them. So I don't know what if you have any thoughts about that. Absolutely. My only thought is that's why we need more investigative journalists. Yeah, I, I agree. A amen to that. Well, Brian, thank you so much for your time. Uh, good luck with your endeavors. And hopefully we'll have you, you back on again. And, and when, you, when you have some time to share with us some of those, you know, uh, documentaries that you're working on, let us know. I, I sent you want to keep keep it quiet for now before. For now. For now. <laughs> for now. OK. I don't want to well, give it away to other reporters. All right. Well, thanks again, Brian. Thanks, everyone, for watching the original Gangsters podcast or listening. Please uh, subscribe and follow us on social media. I'm Jimmy Bucciolato. For Scott Bernstein, we're out.